Okay, we're going to continue with our study on Cain and Abel. If you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4, we've, um, we've covered a couple of verses in four weeks. And we'll go ahead and wrap this up today, Lord willing. Genesis chapter 4 says, And Adam knew his Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, then sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. It's about as far as we're gonna as we're gonna read this this morning. We know the story. We've been dealing with it now for four weeks. This is week number five, um, and we've looked at we've looked at quite a bit in this. We've looked at the fact that that Abel's offering was brought by faith. We're told that over in the book of Hebrews, which argues that there was a revelation that he knew what it was that God wanted, and he brought exactly what it was that God wanted. Um, and and it, I don't think it's a coincidence that exactly what he brought ended up being what God wanted, according to Moses, in 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 Moses's writings. It's exactly what he expected. It was the slaughter of an innocent victim, and the blood shed, to acknowledge the fact that Abel was a sinner, and was incapable of recovering himself from that sin, whereas Cain's offering was of the fruit of the ground. It was his own works. It was something that doesn't just happen naturally. You know, if you take, you take a, a male sheep and a female sheep and put them in a pen somewhere together and leave them alone, and if they're both healthy, you know what you're going to have in a few months? You're going to have baby sheep. You don't have to be involved in the growth of that. But I have yet to see anybody grow fruit without being out there tilling the ground and working it. Cain's offering was based on human works and not based upon what it was that God wanted. And that's why God didn't have respect to it. And that's why God didn't have respect to Cain. Now, we're going to cover just a few more points on this. And, and so if, you, if you've missed some of the last lessons, they're on the website. Go back and take a listen to them. Um, I don't, I don't want to review all of it. but. Um, but today I want to look at, at one of the main problems that Cain had and understand that even a regenerate son of God still has to fight certain sinful desires that he has because you're still stuck to this flesh. The spirit and the soul, or, or, or the spirit and the heart, those are changed. They're regenerated. You, you're given a new heart 
you're given the Holy Spirit in regeneration, but you're not given a new body. That doesn't take place until the resurrection. So during the rest of your time on this planet, even though you're a child of God, you're still battling that sinful flesh. That's why the Apostle Paul said over in Romans, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So one of the things that we have to battle with is the main problem that Cain had when it came to Abel, and that's envy. Cain envied Abel. Now the word envy means to feel displeasure and ill will at the superior, superiority of another person in happiness, success, reputation, or the possession of anything desirable. To regard with discontent another, another's possession of some superior advantage which one would like to have for himself. That's envy. That is what envy is. Now there are, there are some examples of this that we can find in the scriptures. First I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 26. We'll look at a, at a few of these. Genesis chapter 26. And verse 14. And we're talking about Isaac here. Um, in verse 14 it says, for he, for he, that would be Isaac, for he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. They envied him because of all the wealth that he had. You know, that's one of the things that people tend to do, especially in an ungodly civilization that we live in today. They envy people that are better off than they are. Just look at the world. Why in the world, where else would you be able to have a hit television program called Keeping Up with the Kardashians? Is that not based on envying the lifestyle of those people? Of course it is. And that's one of the things that one of the things that Satan constantly does is just keep pushing this stuff in front of you so that you think, well, it's okay to be that way because everybody's that way. No, it's not. It's sinful behavior. You should not envy someone else. Wherever someone is on whatever ladder they're on, they are there because God put them there. To envy them is to argue with God, therefore. You shouldn't envy them because of that. If, uh, now, we live in a country where if you want to better yourself, you can certainly do that. And you can go out and build something yourself. As long as, and as long as you don't break what this book says, that's fine. But don't envy another person over that. That's sinful. Look at Genesis chapter 30 and verse 1. Oh. And when Rachel, you remember Rachel, Rachel was the, was the bride of Jacob that he wanted to marry first. And you know it's an interesting thing, you, you always get back what you pay out and since he had tricked his brother, uh, he ended up getting tricked too and he ended up marrying Leah. Um, I've often wondered how in the world he didn't catch that one before the sun came up. but. But he didn't, apparently, and I guess they had good wine in those days. I, I just don't, but anyway, and, and in, you know, back then the marriage ceremony was not a big deal. It was just, she goes in the tent and you consummate the marriage and that's, you're married. That's the way it worked back then. But, but anyway, Rachel was the one that he worked another seven years for. She was the one that he really wanted to start with. And, and when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Jacob, give me children or else I die. You see, envy. That it happens with everybody. Look at Genesis 37 and verse 11. Genesis 37, 11. And his brethren envied him. This is talking about Joseph. Joseph had had a dream 
and he told his family about the dream that he had, that he'd had that there were sheaves in the field and they had bowed down to to his sheave basically were bowing down to him and and so his brothers envied him because of that but his father understood he paid attention to it paid attention to what he said um, but there again there's envy within the family we have it within the family we have it within all look at Psalm chapter 106 where we will find that that during the times in the wilderness there were those who envied Moses and we remember some of them coming forward remember Corey coming forward and making problems with uh, for, for Moses um, and David refers to that here in, in Psalm chapter 106 and verse 16 where he says they envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron the saint of the, Lord, the saint of the Lord so we see these examples of envy now I want to show you something that that the scripture teaches about this topic of envy first I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 5 because it's in the list of excludable offenses Back here, Galatians chapter 5 we'll begin at verse 19 in order for the context where it says now the works of the flesh are manifest envy is the work of the flesh okay works of the flesh are manifest which are these adultery fornication uncleanness lasciviousness idolatry witchcraft hatred variance emulations wrath strife seditions heresies envyings murders drunkenness revelings and such like of the which I tell you before as I have also uh, told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God you can be thrown out of the church for that you can be kicked out of the kingdom of God for that one envying now I don't know how you go about proving it but you can certainly do it it's considered a work of the flesh it is an excludable offense it also if you turn to 1st Corinthians chapter 3 you will see that the Apostle Paul was charging that church with with the problem of envy and and in this charge he showed that it evidences a lack of spiritual growth 1st Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1 and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? You see, envy, people that envy one another and, and show that outwardly, it's, it shows a lack of, of spiritual growth. It also, over in Galatians chapter 5, see, it's one thing for Cain to be involved in this, the, but the bad news is that we as Christians can be involved in it as well. And that's the point I'm trying to make here. It's not unusual for a child of the devil to be involved in envy. Unfortunately, though, it's not unusual to find children of God doing this, copying that. And that's, and that's the warning that I'm trying to make. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 26 says, Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Vain glory, that's exclusive vanity excited by one's own performances, empty pride, undue elation of mind have you ever heard the old saying that the man is a legend in his own mind you ever heard that one that's vain glory and there are people like that everywhere that think they are just that special and that's a problem that brings about envy it also goes hand in hand with strife in Philippians chapter 1 In verse 15, we read, Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. And in Romans chapter 13, 
verses 13 through 14. Let us, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You see, these are Christians that Paul's writing to and still pointing out the fact that we can fall into this, in, into this devilish condition. And I use the term devilish because that's the way that James describes it. Look at, look at James chapter 3. All the way back here. James chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. And it stems from pride, and it breeds war. And all of us have a problem with it. In James chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, James says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your own lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. You see, when you're envying someone, you're trying to build yourself up. And you are the last person who should try to build yourself up. Let God build you up. God resists those. He resists the proud. Now, it's one thing to take pride in something that you might have accomplished, but when it comes to the things of God, you've got nothing to be proud of other than the fact that God felt mercy on you and made you a child of God. Don't look to yourself. Don't think that you understand more than someone else because you are so much better of a, of a person. That's, God gives these gifts to men. He gives graces to men. He decides who. Use what he has given you to the very best of your ability, but don't start, don't start trying to figure out a way to, 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 you know, one of the reasons that we're no longer primitive Baptists was because some of the primitive Baptists got very envious of my father in the ministry and did everything they could to make sure that he wasn't around anymore because he was getting too popular. They didn't like the fact that he was getting too many, having too many opportunities to preach and he was cutting into some of these other guys' turf. That was all about envy. Now, it turned out as a good thing because there were other issues out there, but still, that's what envy can do. Envy can absolutely destroy a church. If people start to get envious of one another or start to look at somebody and think, well, he's, you know, he's better than him and I want, it, it's a bad thing. And we need to remember that and stay away from it. Um, it's also, we're told over in Ezekiel chapter 35 and verse 11, that it's actually hatred. Ezekiel chapter 35 and verse 11. Therefore as I live, saith the Lord God, I will do even according to thine anger and according to thine envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them. You see, when you envy someone, you actually hate that person. You are showing forth hatred towards that person. And in Titus chapter 3, In verse 3, we read, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, 
serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. And we're told in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 4 that charity envieth not. So you see, envy comes from hatred, not from charity. And we are not to hate one another. We are to love one another. And as was the case with Cain and Abel, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 4.4, 4, for every right word a man is envied of his neighbor. It's also physically harmful. Turn to Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 30. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. And we're told in Job 5.2, For wrath killeth the foolish man, and envy slayeth the silly one. If you turn to Mark chapter 15, we will see how far envy can go. Mark chapter 15 and verse 10. Let's go back a little bit. This is at the trial of Christ. In verse 4, Pilate asked him, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold us how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast he released unto them one prisoner whomsoever they desired, and there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them, that had made insurrection for him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done to them. And But Pilate answered, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. The Lord Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross because of envy. That's how devilish this sin can be. And it's in every single one of us and we have to, we have to deal with it. So when you start feeling like that might be, a, now it's, you know, it's one thing, it's one thing if you're if you're trying to point something out to someone, if you know someone really, really well, and you're trying to warn one of your brethren not to get too involved with that person because of who, that's not envy, okay? It may appear to be envy, but that's not envy. But if you truly, within your heart, want something that someone else has, and you try to go about making plans to figure out how in the world you're going to do that by either running them down or making them lower in someone else's sight would build you up that's envy do, do you see the you see the difference and it's within all of us and we have to be very very careful with it um think about this the case of saul king saul and david now, i'm not going to turn to the scriptures but you remember that saul got upset with david why? Because David was more popular than he was. You know, they said that Saul had killed his thousands and David had killed his tens of thousands. The people, David was more popular than King Saul. And what did King Saul decide he wanted to do? He took out to kill him. That's envy. That's what envy can lead to. That's what killed Abel. It was envy within Cain that killed Abel. That's what killed the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 and verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes... This is what the, the apostles were out preaching. And now the, these Jews, the Pharisees and uh, the unbelieving Jews, when they see 
how many people are attending the church service of these apostles rather than them. Okay, that's what they're talking about here. When the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. You see, that's what envy does. He's got more people than I do. Well, therefore, I'm going to do something to go get more. I'm going to, he must be wrong. Now, I might say that about someone like Joel Osteen, because he's got more people in his church than, than I do. But, but if I say something that's wrong, believe me, it's not because of envy. It's because the man's a heretic. So that's, so that, but if I were picking on another one of our ministers that believes the same thing that I do, that has more people in his church, well, that could be envy. That could be because of envy, but, you know, so, but in your lives, you've got to be careful of this. Don't be desirous of, of what someone else has. Don't start to be covetous of someone else's possessions, because that leads to envy. And envy is a devilish and hateful thing. And when we envy one another or another by yielding to our flesh, we become very base and we become very Cain-like. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 6. Because there are some people that will say, well, I'm a Christian, I can't do that. I, 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 I could... Yeah, well, yeah, you can. You can. You still have that same flesh nature that you always had. You don't get rid of that one until you drop dead. And then when you drop dead, you rot. And you won't get your flesh back until the resurrection. Um, Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey. Now, stay right here for a second, but look back at Romans. Keep your hand here. Go back to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom ye all among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. He is writing to saints here. He's not writing to dead, lost, alien sinners, telling them not to yield themselves to, to the devil. He is writing to children of God, telling them not to yield to the spirit of the devil. Therefore, a Christian can get involved in every bit of this stuff if they yield themselves to it. So don't forget that all of these letters that were written by the Apostle Paul were written to churches. They were written to saints. They were written to God's children. That's the context of every single one of them. They're not written to lost people telling lost people how to get saved. They're written to saved people that are already saved telling them how they got saved and how they can enter into fellowship with God. Just pay attention to what it says in the first couple of verses of each one of these, of, of these letters of Paul and, you'll, and it's unmistakable. He's not writing to lost people. That's why people get so confused. They, they lose sight of that. And they think this is some sort of road map to get eternally saved. But it's written to save people. It doesn't tell you how to get saved. You're already saved because it was already written to you. Does, it, does that make sense? So here in, in Romans chapter 6 in verse uh, 16 again, Know ye not, no saints, know ye not, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. You see that? Even we can become like Cain. Even we can get into the flesh. And even we can fall into any one of those sins. And that's why they're listed over there as the works of the flesh. 
And that's something we have to always remember. You know, another interesting point about this, over in Genesis 4 and verse 7, we read it quickly this morning. And it's kind of a minor point, but, but worth the making. Genesis chapter 4. And verse 7 says, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Do you realize that if Cain had have repented, he would have ruled over Abel? He was the eldest. Cain was the eldest. He had the birthright. He would have ruled over Abel. Abel. But instead, he ended up killing him. Now, it's important to note that, that God had specifically given laws to the people that the eldest would rule in, secular, in the secular world. Interesting point. You see, the godly do not have a divine right to rule when it comes to things that go on in this world. We don't have that divine right. And God had specifically said that the elder would be the one that would, would have the birthright. Look at Deuteronomy. Um, let's see where I'm at here. De 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 I know it's in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 21. Verses 15 through 17. If a man have two wives, one beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated, and if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath, for he is the beginning of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. Cain was the firstborn. Cain would have ruled. He had the birthright as far as this world is concerned. Not as far as heaven is concerned, but as far as this world is concerned. Look at Genesis chapter 49. You know, I've, I find this interesting also, and in, 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 and I don't have a Bible verse for this, but just from experience, have any of you ever run into a, into a situation where a family shows favoritism to one or the other of children, and they always seem to pick the second one? You ever notice that? They always tend to pick the second child. The second one ends up being the favorite. I just, I just find that interesting. So, I mean, not that it means not that it means anything, but I just find it interesting. It's another one of those little areas where the flesh gets in the way. Genesis chapter 49 and verse 3. Reuben, thou art my first um, thou art my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it. He went up um, to my couch. I know where I'm going with this, but this doesn't look like the right verse. First, let me. Did I link this together? And we might have to. First Chronicles five. 
Oh, here we go. First Chronicles chapter 5. Reuben was the firstborn of Jacob. Should have had the birthright. Didn't get the birthright. Joseph got the birthright. Why? If he was supposed to get the birthright, why didn't he? Well, because he defiled his father's bed. He jumped in the sack with one of Jacob's concubines. I'm not going to go back. That was, that's over in Genesis chapter 35, I think. You can go look at that yourselves. But, um, but for that reason, he lost the birthright. But he should have had it. He should have had it by the fact that he was the firstborn, but he gave it up because of his... Um, sinful desires. In 1 Chronicles chapter 5, we have the story where it says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but forasmuch as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not reckoned after the birthright. For Judah prevailed ab above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler. But the birthright was Joseph's. You see, ordinarily, the birthright would have been Reuben's. Even though the Lord Jesus Christ came out of Judah, Judah didn't get the birthright. It should have been Reuben's, but since Reuben had sinned, then Jacob was free to give it to the sons of Joseph. So... The point is that Cain would have ruled. He was the firstborn. He had that right. He had the birthright. Um, and in the secular realm, remember that rule and power are not a divine right of the godly. So don't be surprised if rule and power are not in the hands of the godly. Now, we're, we are the next told that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he slew him. You know, it's interesting that Cain brought an offering to the Lord that was an unbloody offering. His religion started out unbloody, and it ended very bloody in persecution, as it always does. Abel had killed an innocent lamb to satisfy God's vengeance, whereas Cain killed an innocent man to satisfy his own vengeance. And in doing so, Cain usurped the place of God. Cain believed that it was his law that had to be obeyed, not God's, but Cain's law. Cain's law rules. And he believed that whoever transgressed Cain's law must die, as in the case of Abel. And he demanded that his vengeance must be satisfied. Turn to Romans chapter 12. This is one of those passages that I have tacked up on my bulletin board. And I read it constantly because it's got a whole lot of good stuff in it. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Somebody does something to you, don't take it upon yourself to get even with them. Turn it over to God and let him deal with it. Let him take care of the vengeance. Vengeance is the infliction of pain on another in return for an injury or offense. Such infliction, when it proceeds from malice or mere resentment, and is not necessary for the purposes of justice, is revenge and is a most heinous crime. When such infliction proceeds from a mere love of justice and the necessity of punishing offenders for the support of the laws, it is vengeance and is warrantable and just. In this case, vengeance is a just retribution, recompense, or punishment. In this latter sense, the word is used in Scripture and frequently applied to the punishments inflicted by God on sinners. Now let's look at this verse again. Romans chapter 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Avenge 
means to take satisfaction for an injury by punishing the injuring party, to vindicate by inflicting pain or evil on the wrongdoer. Don't do that. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place under wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. Now, when vengeance is when the punishment of vengeance is brought about because someone broke a law, it is just to inflict the punishment that that, that, that deserves. And there's a place for that. For the ungodly, there is a place where vengeance will be repaid. And it's at the end of this life and lasts for eternity. It's called hell now it will be called the lake of fire in the future. Now a lot of people have have the idea, in fact we had a former member of the church that had gotten into the idea that that there was no eternal punishment. But clearly from scripture that's not so. Clearly in scripture it mentions that. And if God has put in place the fact that if you do this, this is the punishment, then he is not just if he does anything other than gives you the punishment that he said that he would do. Parents, listen, and, and those that will be parents someday, listen to this and listen to it very, very well. If you tell your child that if you do that, this is the punishment, and they do it, which they will, you better deliver the punishment that you told them, and you better be swift about it. Don't be one of those parents that say, well, if you touch that, well, this is what's going to, uh, this is what's going to happen. And then they touch it and you say, if you touch it again, don't do it again, don't do it again 58 times, then you're not being just. If you tell your child that this is the punishment that you will receive if you do that act, and they do that act, which they will do, then you better live up to what you told them you were going to do. And you better do it swiftly. Because otherwise, it's not vengeance, folks. And you're, you have, you're not being just. I say that to say this. If God tells people, this is what's going to happen to you, and then they do what he told them not to do, and he doesn't give them what he told them would happen to them, he's unjust. And he would be denying himself, and he would be a liar. And God cannot lie, and he cannot deny himself, and he is ultimately just. Vengeance is not out of line. Revenge is out of line. Remember, pay attention to primary meanings of the words. When God makes a specific instruction that if you do this, this is the outcome, then he is bound by that to give you the outcome that he said would come when you do it. Does that make sense? And it's the same way with parents and families. If you tell your son, you do this, this is what's going to happen, and they do it, you got to live up to what you said was going to happen. Otherwise, you're under. Now, I know that every one of us has slipped on that one. It's okay. You're not going to go to hell over it. But remember, in the future, that, that this, is, this is one of those things that goes to character. If you raise your children so that they understand what vengeance is and they understand that there's accountability for their actions, you end up with better adults than if you just let them run wild. And if you feel like, well, I'm going to be more merciful to them and I'm not going to punish them for their bad behavior and I'm going to let them get away with it, well, you're going to raise rotten adults because they're just not going to, they're not going to understand accountability. And, and if, you, if you think I'm wrong on that, I come from the 60s generation. I come from the Dr. Seuss generation. I come from that generation where people, Dr. Spock, I'm sorry. Dr. Seuss too? Green eggs and ham? I'm all about green eggs and ham, Sam I am. Um, Dr. Spock, yes, doctor, thank you. Um, 
But that's, see, that, this is the generation where people decided, well, we're not going to spank our children. We're going we're to be more kind than the generation that I came from where, where all my mother had to say was the word Bill in that, in that particular voice. And my sister and I would both cower because we weren't sure which one was going to get it but we knew somebody was. And my dad could have his belt off faster than you can snap your fingers, okay? That was how I was raised. But then the generation that, the people that grew up around me, that's not, now look at society. If you think I'm making stuff up, look at society, look at it today. Is it not worse off than it was back then? There's no accountability for anything these days. Well, vengeance. Pay attention to vengeance, but don't avenge yourself as Cain did. Abel did something that Cain didn't like. And so he took out his vengeance on Abel, which shows definitely that he was of that wicked one. Look at uh, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12, which is where it flat tells us that. 1 John chapter 3. And verse 12. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. And Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14 and verse 14 says, I have, this is talking about Lucifer, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. There's the wicked one. And that's exactly what Cain was trying to do. Usurp the law of God and take his place. His real problem was with God. Cain's real problem was with God. But he took his revenge out on the man who represented God. And as Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 1.9, there is no new thing under the sun. Now, the zeal of Cain's religion, and remember, he was very religious. He showed up at the right time. He brought his offering. He came to the place he was supposed to be. He was religious. But his religion became persecution, which is the zeal of all false and apostate religion. You know, it's, it's interesting that one of the things that our founding fathers did that was right is they wrote the First Amendment. Now, I know that there are those that, on the more liberal side of things, that think that means that there's supposed to be a separation between church and state, and, and that they're supposed, but that's not what it says. Go home and read it. What it says is that, that they're not gonna make any, uh, they're not gonna establish a religion. Most countries had established state churches. Italy had the Roman Catholic Church, do they not? What else do you find in Italy? What other kind of churches would you find in Italy? Scotland has a Presbyterian Church. That's what you're going to find in Scotland. You're going to find Presbyterian churches in Scotland. You go to England, you're going to find the Anglican Church, Church of England. Countries had established state churches supported by the state. And what happens whenever there's a state church? They persecute anybody that is not part of the state church. False religion always persecutes others because it's all they've got. And that's how they deal with So our founders, that was one thing they did right. They made sure that we didn't have a state church. So at least in this country, you can still worship how you feel you want to worship and not be too terribly persecuted for it. But his zeal ended up bringing persecution. Turn to Matthew chapter 23. When we started this series, this, we, we, we read this entire chapter, um, and we keep going back to it. But on this point, Matthew chapter 23, verse, um, verse 34, 
Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel and to the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar, from A to Z, all of them. Persecution. They persecute apostate and false religion, persecutes true religion. It always has, it always will. Philippians chapter 3. Verses 4 through 6. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, is touching the law of Pharisee. Concern, concerning zeal, this is the Apostle Paul in his days before his conversion, persecuting the church touching the righteous which is in the law blameless. You see, persecution. Look at Revelation chapter 18. Because it's not going to change, folks. It's going to continue that way until Christ returns. False religion is going to persecute true religion. It always has and it always will. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 24 says, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. And we're talking about the great whore there. Um, where, where God had said in verse 4 of that chapter, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. God has his children trapped up in false religion. And he puts the call out there to come out of her. And the same type of hate that prompted Cain to kill Abel prompts the world to this day to persecute Christians. Now again, in this country, it hasn't been so bad. But in other countries, it can get downright horrible. You know, it wasn't so good in Cuba there for a while. If you were a Christian, that, that would buy you a 45 gallop caliber round and a burial in an open grave somewhere. And in other parts of the world, well, we, we, see, it on TV, we see it on television now, right? Beheadings and, and such. False religion persecuting true religion because of hatred. In 1 John chapter 3, and so we are, we are admonished not to do that. There's one thing that you can say for for our church and that is that it's never been involved in starting wars. We don't go out and try to force people to become our kind of Christian. We don't force them at gunpoint. That cannot be said for the Roman Catholics. That cannot be said for Presbyterians and Episcopalians and all those other bunches out there. If you, if you live within their area and you don't convert to their religion, it can mean death to you. Now, it's not as obvious today, but that doesn't, but, you know, go back a couple of thousand years. Take a look at history. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain who was of that wicked one and slew his brother and wherefore slew he him because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. You see, don't be surprised because that same kind of hate that prompted Cain to kill Abel is still around and it now prompts people to hate Christians. And that same hate prompted the world to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at John chapter 3.
John chapter 3 and verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. And in John chapter 7, John chapter 7 and verse 7, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify it, of it, that the works thereof are evil. In Matthew chapter 27, we have a parallel passage to one that we read just a few minutes ago, dealing with the trial of Christ before Pontius Pilate. And in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 18, we read, um, well, let's go back. Let's look at verse 17. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas, or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. The slaughter of the Lord Jesus Christ was because of envy by apostate religion. The slaughter of Abel was because of envy by apostate religion. And in that regard, Abel was a prototype of this crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now I'm going to close, I'm actually going to close on this point. Um, while Abel, Abel was the second son of Adam. He was the first elect child born on the earth from the union of Adam and Eve and he was the first human ever to enter into heaven. Now on the positive note for Abel he didn't have to put up with this world very long and he's been in heaven ever since. So his martyrdom was well paid off and God took care of the one of his and Cain struggled from then on. With that, I thank you for your very kind and patient attention over the course of the last five weeks. Uh, next week, we will pick up with something else, Lord willing. Let's stand and be dismissed in prayer.